Okay, so I've probably been to over a dozen of these rallies so far, and I have never seen it this crazy this early on. This protest was one of hundreds of pro-Palestinian marches that have broken out around the country since Hamas's attack on Israel last year. Palestine will be free. On October 7th, terrorists raped and tortured civilians, murdered 1,200 people, and took 250 hostages. Many protesters are calling for an end to Israel's ongoing counteroffensive in Gaza. But increasingly, the message is not one of peace. It's one of revolution and violence against the state of Israel and anyone who supports it. The revolution is the people versus the government. That's all you need to know. The people versus the government. Not black people, not Palestinians, everybody. The people versus the government. Israel came onto their land and colonized it. I'm struck by how many people are using academic language, concepts like colonized and colonizer. I have a degree from Columbia University in history and war and revolution. Radical ideas from the ivory tower have made their way into mass protests on the streets and put a new twist on an old prejudice. We decided to go to the source, to visit the institutions that originated this language, and ask how it has come to define protesters' understanding of the Israel-Palestine conflict. The struggle of imperialism and colonialism is intersectional, and nobody is free until we are all free. Political action on campus often reflects national movements. In recent years, college students have demonstrated for Black Lives Matter, the Me Too movement, and calls for trans rights. But when pro-Palestinian rallies kicked off around the country this fall, we heard from students who said things on campus felt different. My Jewish sisters and brothers and I are on the receiving end of death threats from our peers. Radical progressive politics were metastasizing into open anti-Semitism. Overnight, the very people who had spent years demanding safe spaces and complaining about microaggressions transformed into free speech absolutists. Shut up! Free Palestine, bro. Get your shit out of What happened? The rhetoric, both from students and faculty leaders, has been deeply worrying for the The University of Pennsylvania, and, one of the most selective schools in the world, faces some of the strongest criticism. Last year, the college hosted several anti-Semitic speakers at a festival on Palestinian literature. The event featured Mark Lamont Hill, who was fired by CNN for calling for the destruction of Israel. And, maybe most notably, Roger Waters, the really wacky former Pink Floyd vocalist, who's publicly used anti-Jewish slurs desecrated the memory of Anne Frank and has dressed up as a Nazi and floated a pig balloon with the Star of David at many of his concerts. And when activists across the country began tearing down posters of Israeli hostages... It's misinformation that they're kidnapped? It's misinformation. Okay, so why are you tearing them down? The Penn campus was no exception. Every single one is a flyer that was ripped out. You can see the remnants of it, like literally all over. Eyal Jacobi is a Penn senior tracking the uptick in anti-Semitic incidents. This is where the swastika was found, spray painted in a spray booth. It was in here, I believe, in the spray booth. 
I don't know where. In, in the past month at Penn, there's been six different physical incidents of, you know, Jew hatred, whether it be a swastika, whether it be a Jewish fraternity house, being, uh, you know, vandalized with Jews or Nazis. Since October 7th, Eyal's been eating meals at the Campus Hillel, where Jewish students have been sharing their experiences. I'm sure a lot of you woke up on October 8th and realized that there had been a terrorist attack in, in Israel. And when did you first started to notice that maybe other people on campus weren't perceiving it as an act of terrorism? It must have been 11.30 a.m. was Penn Against the Occupation organizing a rally for the next day, literally while Hamas terrorists were still in Kibbutzim. And, and that's when I kind of realized that we have members in the community who actively want to defend it and, and justify it. That was really eye-opening. The reason why I even like got involved with like speaking out about any of this was because at one of the rallies, my Hebrew and Judaica advisor said Israel desecrates the memory of those who died in the Holocaust. Israel is the epitome of anti-Semitism. My grandfather survived the Holocaust and his father and his brother were murdered. And I just was standing there and I'm like, who is this woman? My great grandfather who was killed, his name was Israel. You don't think he would have been proud of the state of Israel? In the aftermath of October 7th, students were surprised to find their own professors speaking out in support of the murderous attack. A UC Davis assistant professor is under fire tonight for things they posted on social media platform X. One group of people we have easy access to in the U.S. is all these Zionist journalists who spread propaganda and misinformation. They have houses with addresses, kids in school. They can fear their bosses, but they should fear us more. At the end of the post, a knife, an axe, and blood emojis. Mika Tosca described Israelis, Jews as pigs, savages, and irredeemable excrement. Stanford University has suspended a lecturer following accusations that he directed Jewish students in his class to stand in the corner and describe Israelis as colonizers. Hamas has shifted the balance of power. Yeah. Hamas has punctured the illusion of invincibility. It was exhilarating, it was energizing. The only criminal thing is settler colonialism. It is completely not acceptable for a professor at Columbia to call what Hamas did something worthy of jubilation and awe, a stunning victory. I think that anti-Semitism plays uh, some role in explaining what's been happening on campus and how administrators have been responding. Political scientist Yasha Monk writes about the history of identity politics on college campuses. The new ideology about race and gender and sexual orientation that's become so influential in our society as a whole, in particular on college campuses, uh, gives you a few basic conceptual categories to understand the world. The first is that it'll split the world into whites and people of color, and think that that is really the key distinction that explains the contemporary United States, but also other parts of the world. The second is to distinguish between dominant people, in particular colonizers, and the dominated or the colonized. Now, if you apply all of that to the very complicated situation in Israel-Palestine, it suddenly looks deceptively simple. And it's impossible for those oppressed people to do anything bad, anything unjust, towards their oppressors. And so suddenly you can reconceptualize something like the terrible, gruesome Hamas massacre on October 7 as a form of righteous resistance against white colonials. Glory to the martyrs! Glory to the martyrs! The problem to me is with what campus culture becomes if a few activists to dominate it. So it's enough for a relatively small percentage of students to want to intimidate people who support Israel or to intimidate anybody who happens to be Jewish for that to become a very unpleasant atmosphere. I'm heading to Cooper Union now. There have been reports that Jewish students are locked in the library. I believe they are 
there for safety reasons and there are reports circulating, security feel outnumbered. Several Jewish students who wish to remain anonymous recounted their experience in the library that afternoon. So a bunch of us went to the library because security or some teachers locked the door because they heard people coming and then they were shouting like, free car sign, free car sign. We all heard the loudest banging on metal doors, floors shaking, walls shaking. We all ran from our seats. Once they were banging on the library, let us in, let us in, let us in. It was very scary. Yeah. I definitely feel hatred towards me. I've never been scared like that because I realized if they came in, then there was nothing I could do to stop them. A lawyer for the Jewish students held a press conference the following day. We have been retained by a number of the students who were impacted by yesterday's horrific events. Students felt afraid for their safety. They feared for their lives. This is unacceptable in New York City. This is unacceptable anywhere in the United States. This is fake news. You are supporting fake news. While some students disputed the threat posed to Jewish students, tensions were reaching a breaking point. The rally was here too, though? Right here, yes, yes, yes. Here to the right. The very next day at Tulane University in Louisiana, threats turned to violence. They were trying to burn an Israeli flag and a student jumped out and the first instinct that he had was to try and save the flag. And as he was saving it, one of the kids hit the person with the flag. All hell broke loose after that. One had a megaphone, he whacked one of our friends, broke his nose. There was punches thrown, there was blood on the ground. Just escalated very fast. Tell me what happened next, okay? Yeah, someone just pretty much went up to me and hit me. She seemed to come for you. Yeah, I just stood on the pro-Israel side. I had no Israeli flag. It was because I was Jewish. I was surprised that this could happen on a university in the United States, that people could be calling for my genocide and also that someone just came up to me and assaulted me um, just for being Jewish. Despite a more than threefold increase in anti-Semitic incidents after October 7th, some influential voices claim that the real threat is to the speech of anti-Israel students and faculty. I don't see any rise of anti-Semitism. I see a rise of anti-Zionism. The two things are very different. They're not the same. Columbia professor Mahmoud Mamdani is one of many faculty members who signed an open letter supporting the right of pro-Palestine students to protest. So this is the letter and you're one of um, the signees. A lot of it has to do with um, protecting the free speech rights of Palestine supporters. We need to create an arena where, which is more inclusive than exclusive. That the university should not just be an arena for supporters of the state of Israel. Do you think that Jewish students feel terrified to express pro-Israel sentiments, though? I mean, I can't speak in such generalities as Jewish students, but I can tell you that the Jewish students in my class are not scared. I went here, I went to the journalism school, and in my experience, I mean, this was a campus in which misgendering people was violence. I just am surprised that there would be a tolerance for anti-Semitism when there's so much intolerance towards other kinds of hatred. Well, look, you have to prove that there's tolerance for anti-Semitism. But if a speaker is anti-Semitic, they should still be. They should be confronted. We're not going to ask people to produce their transcripts, vet them, and say, OK, you can talk, you cannot talk. Come on. It's a place for debate. I mean, we don't, this is not a police station. It's not a police state, OK? We don't decide what speech is acceptable, what speech is not acceptable. I think it often, Colombia often has, though. It's time to change. Mamdani made no public statement when Fire named his college the worst in the U.S. for free speech in 2022. 
nor when hundreds of students disrupted campus Republican events in 2017. Students say administration rules make hosting major conservative speakers practically impossible. It's selective. There's social justice advocacy. I have friends that marched against the, the, the abortion decision. When the Me Too movement happened, these were students, women and men alike, that came out in unequivocal support with unequivocal and unwavering belief in the women that came forward. But when the rape, when the rape victims are Jews, they want proof. People were protesting before Israel retaliated and they're screaming globalize the Antifada from the river to the sea. We don't want no two state, we want all of it. These are calls for the erasure of Israel and of Jews from the land. And these are your classmates, right? That's what's like, it's gut-wrenching. I have people who I was friends with, whose friendships and relationships I valued. Seeking to contextualize what Hamas did to thousands of Jews on October 7th. I'm seeing attempts to contextualize and justify the massacre of Jews. Jewish students have learned that there isn't a, quote, safe space for them on campus, like there is for other minority groups. When college presidents were called to testify before Congress in December, their institutional policies were made clear. Does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Penn's code of conduct when it comes to bullying and harassment? Yes or no? It is a context-dependent decision, Congresswoman. It can be, depending on the context. If her chance, which can be anti-Semitic depending on the context, when calling for the elimination of the Jewish people. Again, it depends on the context. The presidents of UPenn and Harvard, both of which are now being sued by students for, quote, pervasive anti-Semitism, resigned when their apparently indifferent testimony drew public outrage. But their attitude reflected a common one on campus. Protesters largely deny that there is significant anti-Semitism in their movement. But in DC, at the largest pro-Palestinian rally to date, what I heard was revealing. It's not their land, it's our land. Yeah. And they're killing them. And they tell them either you go live in a desert so they can take their land. They said, no, we're not leaving our country. One guy, he was just walking. They pushed him. He's Arabian. They pushed him. He's black. Who's they? Uh, Jewish. The thing Get away is, from is that we don't like to use the term uh, when we're talking about Israel. We don't like to use the term Jews. We like to use the term Zionist. Wait, can, Zionist. can I ask you? They're not, they're not, yeah. Exactly. But can I ask you, you did use the word Jews. So can I ask you why? Tell me about that. Because they, they, they're they the one who came in 1948. Okay. That's how we know as the uh, Jews. While college students might know better than to say Jew instead of Zionist, data reveals how they actually feel. Among 18 to 24 year olds, 67% believe that Jews, quote, are oppressors and should be treated as oppressors. It is, of course, legitimate to criticize uh, the policies of the state of Israel. And I have done so many times in my own life. You start to get into more complicated waters when you single out the only Jewish state in the world in ways that don't seem to apply when you're talking about other countries. And we've simply learned that the socially respectable way to express that is to say, oh, no, no, hang on a second. Nowadays, we don't say the Jews, we say the Zionists. What happens on campus doesn't stay on campus. No peace on stolen land. An extreme ideology, once written off as fringe, has exploded onto the streets. I will not condemn the Palestinian people fighting against over 75 years of colonialism and genocide by any means necessary. Israel murdered their own people on October 7th. And its followers are targeting Jews everywhere. We all live on campus now. 